Ladies and gentlemen, we present The Big Business Lock by Laurie Wyman and starring Jimmy Edwards, Frank Thornton, and Gwen Cheryl. There's one thing that strikes terror into the hearts of the directors of British United Plastics. It's the memo from their managing director and chairman, Sir Charles Boniface, summoning them to an extraordinary meeting. It usually means one of two things. Either he's dropped the clangor of a lifetime or it's going to cost them a bomb. He's called one of these meetings of the board this morning, so they're all waiting to hear what it is this time and have their letters of resignation and checkbooks at the ready. All right, all right, all right. Settle down now. Tags out. Come along. Sir Charles is about to chat you up to let's have a bit of decorum. That's a bit more like it. I hate to have to raise my voice. Now I have heard everything. That'll do. No muttering in the ranks. Now then, gentlemen, I have called you together this morning to discuss an urgent matter. How much? Oh, how unkind, Mr. Bizet, how unkind. When was the last time I asked the board for that sordid stuff that the hoi polloi call money? Tuesday. Fifty quid for polo pony fodder. Oh, what an accurate memory you have, Mr. Benson. Mind like a ledger. <laughs> Very commendable. <laughs> An asset to the company to put things in needs in these times. Now shut your directorial cake hole, will you? Gentlemen! <clears throat> oh, Lord, here we go. I'll try again. Edith and gentlemen. Thank you. May I continue? Please do. How kind. Daft old bat. I yell! <laughs> Gentlemen, I've asked you all here this morning to discuss the display stand that we're taking at the New York Home Hobbies exhibition. Now, we need a motif. We need a what? Motif. Oh. And it's a French word, meaning motif. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an F on it. <laughs> Only one, though. It's motif. It means an emblem. Something gigantic and cheap that we can stick up on top of the stand to symbolize the unity of our two great countries. Hands across the sea and all that boulder dash. And something that will drag the customers in so we can cop all those lovely dollars. Yes, yes, that does come into it. Of course, how perspicacious of you to think of that. Yes, you see, there'll be so many firms from so many countries exhibiting their products that I feel we need something to make our stand the most attractive. How about a dozen dolly birds in British United Plastic bikinis prancing about to rule Britannia? Uh, that might be symbolic of you, but uh, not of the firm. In any case, it's a very bad number to dance to, I find. No, what I had in mind was some form of statue or image made in our polystuma. What a good idea. Who's the statue to be of? Mr. Wilson. Oh, don't be a nana all your life, Edith. We want the blasted thing to encourage people to visit our stand. <laughs> no, unless anybody has a better idea, I thought the statue should be about 40 foot high, and as I'm head of the firm, it should be a statue of me. <laughs> I thought you said it was supposed to encourage people to visit the stand. <laughs> right. Who wants the 40 foot high? Him. Well, uh, an awful lot of birds might be grateful for it. <laughs> I mean, uh, the ones on Nelson's column could visit him for their holidays. And yes, well, all right, that's, that's, all right, we can scrub that idea, yes. I, that is a hazard that I must confess I hadn't considered. Sir Charles, uh, would it not be advisable to make this emblem a tribute to our American host? Uh, possibly, yes. yes uh, what had you in mind? A statue of Bonnie and Clyde or something? Not exactly. I was thinking that in order to show them just what can be done with polished humor, we could erect a perfect reproduction of the Statue of Liberty. But, but, I think he's got it. I think he's got it. In the words of the immortal bard, Mr. Rex Harrison, I think he's got it. <laughs> I think he's got it. There is just one tiny snag, brother. Mm -hmm. Nothing was more certain. What's this tiny snag? Well, we've had this sort of trouble before, you a polished humor is marvelous for making paint, lino, tents, boats, and so on, but it's very difficult to model with. It's something Mr. Hinkin of our technical department has been trying to solve. And uh, has he? Well, yes, but up to now, he's the only one who can do it successfully. It's still a very tricky operation to get liquid polished humor to exactly the right temperature. What, what, what happens if you don't? One of three things. It sets rock hard in a lump, or it doesn't set at all, 
and 14 char ladies had to spend a week mopping them up. Yes, and what is the third delightful alternative? It goes off bang. <laughs> in that case, we shall obviously have to take this twit Humpty Dumpty or whatever this wretched name is. Hinkin. Well, don't tell me, don't. It, it is worry, not mine. We shall just have to take him off all his other work and let him concentrate entirely on making this Statue of Liberty. I've got to go and see this idiot Hoskin. Hinkin. Oh, don't quibble. I must go and see this stupid idiot and tell him how to get on with it now, then. Uh, where is he kept? Which floor is he on? This one, Sir Charles. Mr. Hinkin is sitting opposite you. Yes, I... Uh, uh, oh, oh, how to do? Good morning. Morning, morning, Hinkin. Morning, Hinkin. Nice, nice of you to turn up. <laughs> well, I haven't said much, has he, up to date? No. Well, you've heard the problem. Uh, can you make this Statue of Liberty with a torch and all that in time? Well, now, there are certain problems, Sir Charles. Well, speak up, man. Speak up. Tell us what it's all about. Well, now, as briefly as I can, and in layman's terms, Sir Charles, it's a question of the byproducts of the Vindensicator output reaching the peak velocity at maximum condensation while the turbo flow of the Plastifors ovens are at 5,000 degrees centigrade. This, of course, must be constant and simultaneous to the bungee valve remaining in the off position through the anti-static woofer back bypass unit, which contains the thrust liquidizer and the glump packing mechanism. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Now, would you like to tell us what the hell that was all about? I think it can be done. Well, by the base, did you say so in the first place? When the anti glump mechanism, I think. And, well, that's it. Meeting closed. Hopkin, Nipkin, Napkin, or whatever you are. <laughs> Get on with it. I want a 40 foot high polystumer Statue of Liberty in New York in a month's time. So stop messing about here, chatting me up with a load of old scientific garbage. Certainly, Sir Charles. Thank order a table at Marco's. I'm taking you to lunch. No, thanks. I can't afford it. <laughs> of course you can. You've got your credit card, haven't you? And if you haven't, borrow somebody else's. I'm hungry. <laughs> Amazing. We're at the right place. Normally, when I tell taxi drivers to take me to Marco's in Spencer Street, I end up at the nearest branch of a chain store full of cardigans and cakes. <laughs> we may be at the right place, but I am not leaving this taxi until I'm sure you are picking up the bill for this lunch. Oh, don't be so small, mind. Of course I am. Now, stop quibbling. The commissioner is trying to open the cab door. Welcome to Marco's, yes. Oh, crumbs. The candle seems to have come off. Frank, what's going on? He broke the taxi. <laughs> the handle has come off. That's very nice. What, 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 what are they going to do about it? Service lunch through the window or something? <laughs> no, it, it's all right. He's, he's gone round to let us out the other side. Sorry about that, little boo-boo. Welcome to Marco's. Uh, don't get out for a second. I'll just stop the traffic so you're safe. <laughs> Yeah. Safe now. Haven't I seen you somewhere? This way, gentlemen. I'll be with you in a moment. I just want to give the driver back his uh, door handle. Blimey, what the hell was that? Well, I'm sorry, old man. I was just trying to give you your door handle back. I hadn't realized the window was closed. <laughs> Don't worry about the glass. I'll sweep it up later. Don't, don't, don't let him, driver. Don't let him. He'll have the broom handle through your radiator. <laughs> he ought to have his your money. Keep the change and drive off before he saws your chassis in half. Don't worry, my Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry about all that. Accidents will happen, you know. Ah! I knew I'd seen you before. Your basher Fremantle from college. <laughs> Gosh, fancy you remembering me. <laughs> It's Snogger Boniface, isn't he? <laughs> That's right, yes. And this is Daddy Snogger Boniface. <laughs> I'm so glad to be included in the conversation. Perhaps you'd like to tell me what it's all about. We were at school together. Oh, don't be daft. We couldn't possibly have been. You're, 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 you're 20 years younger than I am. How could we have been at school oh, together? Sir. Oh, I see. Oh, me, oh, you two idiots were... Oh, you failed your 11 plus together, did you? Yeah. Well, no, no, not exactly that. But we, we failed everything else. We were at Cambridge together. Uh, or was it Oxford? 
Well, there is a difference, you know. <laughs> right, one here. What, what on earth are you doing with a job like this? You were, you were supposed to be a brilliant technician. Well, as I said, I, I just can't pass exams. So I ended up in the old catering trade. As a commissioner? Uh, no, 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 not, not to start with. I was manager here originally. Then one or two accidents started to happen. I sort of started at the top and worked my way down. <laughs> Yesterday, I was in charge of the foyer, actually. Well, then, why have markers shoved you out here on the pavement? Uh, do you know anybody who's managed to break a revolving door? <laughs> well, I, uh, not offhand, no. You do now. You always were accident-prone, weren't you? He was the one who dropped, spilt, or broke so many things at college that nobody ever really noticed rag day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid you're right. Things just seem to happen when I'm around. Either that or they stop dead just because I'm around. But this is ludicrous. I mean, this isn't it. It's ludicrous. Ludicrous. I mean, Frank said that you were supposed to be a brilliant technician. You can't waste your life doing a job like this. The country needs people with knowledge like all that you've got. Well, I've no degrees, you see. Oh, when I sat for the exam, I answered all the questions correctly, of course. Well, then why didn't you pass? Well, just as I was about to hand my papers in, there was this bottle of ink on the desk, you see. I think I'm losing my appetite. <laughs> no, 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 just a minute, Father. I've just had a thought. You haven't. Good gracious, what do you want, applause? <laughs> no, I, I was thinking, I was thinking, look, old Basher Fremantle, he was, was one of the best students of my year. He was the one we all used to crib from. It doesn't seem right that, that all that knowledge should be wasted. Couldn't we give him a job with British United Plastics? Oh, what had you in mind? Supervisor of our destructor unit? <laughs> no, no. I thought with his technical know-how, we, we could give him a job better than being a doorman. Well, I suppose we do need a man of initiative. I mean, let's face it, anyone who can break a revolving door has got initiative. Gosh, I can't tell you how... Terribly grateful I am. Well, don't bother Let then. me shake you by the hand, because it's not... <laughs> oh, crumbs. Is that your watch? <laughs> it was, Mr. Fremantle. It was. I'm most frightfully sorry. The strap must have been weak. Uh, hang on, I'll mend it for you. No, no, don't bother. If you're going to work for us, I have a feeling I'd be better off carrying a sundial. <laughs> Good morning, Edith. Nice to see you again. Oh, Lord, obviously Mr. Fremantle has been to see me. How did you know? Quite simple, really. The door to my office appears to be off its hinges. <laughs> he only just turned the handle. Yeah, with him, that's all it needs. Not that I was surprised to learn that he's been up here. Why? Well, on my way up, I could see electricians and plumbers working on every floor. Every floor? How did you manage well, to... Well, I had to walk up, you see. He's done the lifting as well. Oh, no! Yeah. Stanley, the lift man, reckons that he's never known anybody else who could get the lattice gate out of its socket with one hand. <laughs> well, I presume he was just trying to shut it. Who can tell? All we know is that it's now 25 feet long and 3 feet wide. <laughs> it is enough is enough. Send for Mr. Frank. Good morning, Father. How's that for efficiency? It's quite astonishing. Frank! Your school chum has got to go. Who? Oh, Basher Fremantle. What's he done now? You name it, he's destroyed it. If he stays in another week, this building will be a, a derelict site. Give him his cards and send him back to the labor exchange. I'll do nothing of the sort. Why not? He's their problem, isn't he? Not ours. Why protect them? You just don't understand him. He'll be an asset to us. He's merely suffering a... Uh, persecution complex. Yes, we have a fair idea who he's persecuting. <laughs> exactly. Tell me, which department is he in now? Well, he started in the general office, but I, I had him moved from there. Had him moved? Mm. Why? Well, amongst other things, he managed to staple the stapler to the desk. <laughs> <laughs> so then we put him in accounts. And? He locked the safe and found a combination to the lock that nobody else, including the manufacturers, could find. As I said, he has got to go. No, 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 no. He'll be all right now. I've promoted him to making tea for the technical department. Really? The job? Now what? Well, I just wondered if you'd like to come to the window and say goodbye to Mr. Hinkin. Eh? He seems to be on his way to hospital. What? Hinkin on his way to hospital? It's Fremantle again. He's poisoned him. 
Frank, this is your fault. You should, you should never let him make that tea. He must have burnt it or something. Quick, we, we, we'd better follow Hinky to the hospital and see what's happened. Ah, well, how do you do? I, I suppose with that funny hat and those legs, you're a nurse, are you? How do you do, nurse? <laughs> My name is Sir Charles Boniface. Is it? Well, stripped to the waist. <laughs> oh, I mean, we, we hardly know each other. I mean, I, 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 I mean, if I will, if you, if you, if you I, 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 there seems to be some mistake. I'm not a patient. By the look of you, I'd say you should be. Oh, that's nice. They're always trying to drum up trade, aren't they? Well, now she's mentioned it, I must say you don't look too... That'll do. Don't you start. Nurse, we are inquiring, let us say, me and my son here, that's the thin one on the side here. We're inquiring after Mr. Hinkin or Hopkin or Stiffkin or something. He was admitted here a short while ago. Who? Oh, you mean Mr. Hinkin. Ah, the one with the amnesia. Amnesia? Well, I can assure you, you didn't catch it from either of us. <laughs> Father, amnesia means loss of memory. Ah, well, there you are, and that proves that they be Loss of memory? Oh, no. That won't do at all. He's a very busy man. He's making a statue for us. He's got all the formula and he goes all... Oh, I'm so sorry. You, you just have to give him a pill for it. He's, he's got to be back at work in the morning. Oh, well, you know, it could be six months before he's back to normal. No, no, it couldn't. The exhibition would be over. If you can't get him right straight away, you needn't bother. We'll, we'll just have to get somebody else. Ruthless. Utterly ruthless. Well, merely facing facts, that's all. Well, listen, tell me, nurse. Oh, you're, you're still there. Tell me, nurse. What happened to the daft old fool anyway? Well, no, as far as we know, uh, Mr. Fremantle dropped a teapot on Mr. Hinkins' head. He was trying to get it down from a shelf, you see, and it sort of um, slipped out of his hand. Yes, it would, it would, it would. Trust him. Yes. Mr. Hinkin had mild concussion, and now he seems to have lost his memory completely. All he keeps saying is teapot. What? Teapot. Oh, very handy. All right, well, give him two pills. I'll pay for the second one. <laughs> You've got to get him back to work. Ah, uh, well, you see, no, you see, I'm afraid it's not quite as simple as that. There's some sort of blockage he's suffering from. Oh, well, in that case, you'd better give him a dose of... No, mental... <laughs> mental... mental... Mentally. A mental blockage. Ah. Well, give him some mental... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, you see, no, you see, the thing is, we've got to find the key that will unlock his memory. I think perhaps you better see him. So do I, naturally. Well, you never know, it might help. Although, in Fatty's case... I can't imagine it will. Charming, charming. All right, nurse, lead the way. Certainly. Now, if you just follow me, I'll show you where it... <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Very therapeutic, I'm sure. I should have warned you about that, nurse. He's a compulsive what's-her-name patter. So I had noticed. In here, please, we've put him in a private ward. Good show. Well done. Mm -hmm. Now, you can only stay with him for a few minutes. And I'm not staying with you for one Oh, you and your big mouth. Well, now, hello there, Popkin. Uh, oh, hop, uh, hello there. Feel like getting up, do you? There's a lot to be done, you know. Teapot. Oh. <laughs> now, come along, old chap. Don't mess about. Up to days with you, and let's get back to work on that statue for the New York exhibition. Teapot. He's just not paying attention, you see. Now, look here. Teapot. Shut up. Teapot. And coffee. <laughs> Sprouts to you, you... Ooh, you I shall get cross. <laughs> Frankly, Father, I don't think that sort of attitude is going to get you anywhere. We shall have to tackle him gently and psychologically. Very well. And now then, Mr. Hinkett, where do you work and what is the name of your employer? Teapot. <laughs> no, 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 no. Think again. Now, who do you have to report to every day? Teapot. Mr. Hinkett, let us try just once again. You are in charge of our technical department, and you have a brilliant brain. Every day, you solve yet another scientific problem. Now then, let us try to get that brain working again. We'll start with something simple. Uh, what is your name? Teapot. <laughs> and coffee grouch to you, mate, and all. That was a, that was a great success, wasn't yeah. it? Congratulations for the psychological approach. Yes, it's a, this is hopeless. It's a nuisance, but I'll just have to mould that statue myself because this job must not go off the boil. Keep on. Oh, shut up. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, but I'm afraid your time is up. Looks like a prisoner's ridiculous.
Jones. Well, it is too, but the doctor left strict instructions that Mr. Teapot mustn't get... Oh. I mean, Mr. No, I, we know who you mean. When I get back to the office, I'm going to send for Mr. Freeman. And even if it takes me the entire afternoon, I'm going to break him into tiny, tiny little pieces and stuff him into that blasted teapot through the spout! This way, please. After you, Sir Charles. Ah! Got her. And don't say I didn't warn you. Well, now, Mr. Turnbull and um, Miss Short. Though having looked at you, I'm blurred if I can see what you're short of. <laughs> Oh, the situation is that I have got to take over in the laboratory until Mr. Hippie Coppikin, Popper Kickin, whatever he's called, recovers. I'm only too pleased to give you any assistance I can, Sir Charles. Likewise, I'm sure. Yes, well, I, I doubt if I shall need you, Mr. Turnbull, but uh, <laughs> I'm damn certain that Miss Short will have to put in a heck of a lot of overtime. <laughs> Starting tonight. It will be a pleasure. I was rather banking on that, actually. <laughs> now, what point in the manufacture had Heskins got to in the matter of this polystumous Statue of Liberty? Well, he mixed all his ingredients and they're half-baked. Yes. <laughs> Having just seen him, I think that is a fair description, yes. He's got his ingredients mixed and he's half-baked, yes. Now, what do we have to do now? Well, as his chief personal assistant, Sir Charles... Oh, some people have all the luck. <laughs> putting it as briefly as I can, and in lay terms, it is now a question of the byproducts of the Vindensicator output reaching peak velocity at the maximum condensation, whilst the turbo flow of the plastic force... Yes, well, uh, are even from you, I don't want to hear another load of that scientific cosmos. <laughs> Well, naturally, as our senior technician, the crucial stage is in the hands of Miss Short. And so much depends on her accuracy whilst attending to her woofer back bypass unit, which contains her glump packing mechanism. Yes, I bet it does. Yeah. Oh, honestly, I think we've got everything under control, Sir Charles. You speak for yourself. <laughs> Obviously, Sir Charles, as this is an emergency, I am prepared to assist in any way I can. Well, jolly good, then you can start by going home for a week and leaving Miss Short and me to get on with things. Oh, well, you're sure you don't want me here? Oh, oh stay right where you are, Mr. Turnbull. I may need your help if things get too hot. I think become... <laughs> Goodness, I am enjoying this scientific approach, you know. Well, actually, I was referring to the polystumous statue we have in the infrared oven. Oh, what a pity. Oh, it's first things first, Sir Charles, you know. We must see how the lady develops. Hmm? <laughs> My sentiments exactly. I couldn't have put it better myself, right? Uh, let's open up the oven and see if she's cooked. Good morning, Edith. Is the beast from outer Sussex in? <laughs> yes, Mr. Frank, what's left of him. He's been working all night, actually. Him? Working all night? Oh, good gracious, what, what time are the auditors coming? Oh, no, he wasn't cooking the books. He was cooking statues. Oh, dear. Don't tell me he was successful. No, I don't think so. When he went into his office, he said something about the nearest they'd got was a Statue of Liberty with three of them instead of two. <laughs> Three what? Well, that he didn't say. I presume he meant hands or feet. Uh, yes, of course, yes. I, I just wasn't thinking. <laughs> At least I was thinking. <laughs> but I, I wasn't thinking what you were thinking. I Evidently thinking, not. Uh, no. I be, I'd uh, better go and have a word with what's left of him. Uh, I think I have a little news which might cheer him up. Good morning, Father. I said good morning, Father. Hey, Rip Van Winkle. Well, let's face it, he couldn't possibly be the sleeping beauty. Hey, what? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Turn her to regular five and baste her for ten minutes. <laughs> Father! 
That's me, Frank. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, so it is. Oh, congratulations. Good night. Hey, hey, sit up, sit up. You've got what's left of your hair in the inkwell. Right? Red or black? Black. Oh, well, it could do with a brunette rinse, yes. Good night, good night. Oh, come on, come on. Hinkin is back. Hinkin's back. He, he's fine and he's at work. Hinkin, Hinkin, Hinkin's back. Well, what the hell happened? I spent hours with him at the hospital. I tried the old uh, psychology bit. You know, <laughs> what do you remember about your childhood and all that? And that did it? No, he just kept saying teapot in a higher voice. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, then what the blazes got the fool back to normal? Well, it was quite simple, really. Uh, I thought it might work if I got him to do some work with his hands instead of his brain. Well, well like what? I asked him to make me a cup of tea. <laughs> yes, it, it was right as rain after that. Oh, gosh, it all happens to me, doesn't it? I mean, I, I half destroy myself slaving over a hot stove all night, making funny-looking Statue of Liberty puddings and rock cakes, shatter my eardrums with the ones that went whoosh-bang on me, only to find that the chef is back at work. Did you uh, have any success at all? Well, the last one we made wasn't bad, as a matter of fact. In fact, it was perfect, except that the torch she holds above her head broke off. You know, you know the Dutch mm. Yes, I know. Torch, stand yes, up like with a torch in her hand. Yes. Well, it looks ridiculous because the torch broke off. I mean, she looks as if she's hailing a bus. <laughs> uh, never mind. Look, as time is getting short, I expect Mr. Hinkin will cast a fresh torch and attach it to the hand somehow. The wretched thing is supposed to be on the 8 o'clock flight this evening. You don't have to remind me. That's why I worked all night. Thank goodness we didn't decide to make the statue of me, because, I mean, I hate to think which bit might have fallen off. <laughs> Your moustache? Yes, exactly. That's uh, at least one side of it. Well, when are we due to fly to New York for this ghastly exhibition? We fly there on Tuesday, and on arrival, you go straight to our stand, and after welcoming our transatlantic competitors... Listen, that'll be the day. You then make a short speech about polystumor and unveil the statue above the stand. Oh, I do, I do, do I? Mm. And it's just as well that twit hink in his back, isn't it? Otherwise, I'd be unveiling a statue of a lady who appears to be trying to find the chain of the water name. Right. Very, very, very good exhibition, really. Do I make the speech now, do I or what? If you think sufficient of our American cousins have gathered round the stand, yes. If not, yes. Eh? I, I don't think anybody else is going to turn up to listen to you. Never mind, all the really important people are here. The really important people is the president. No, 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 no. Our plane passed his in mid-Atlantic. He, he's on a worldwide fact-finding mission. Again. Oh, really? I wonder if he'll have time to lean out and shout one word to Harold as he flies over Downing Street this time. If he does, I have a feeling I know what the one word will be. Yes, well, I suppose I'd better get on with it. Right now, let's be... Let's be having you then! Quiet, you American cloth, thank you. Thumbs in line with the seams of your Madison Avenue trousers. Come along, you awful idiot, that's better. Stand up straight, because I'm going to talk to you. Hey, stop chewing you. How can you listen with all that champion going on? Get rid of it. Oh, blimey, you swallowed it. <laughs> now, you all know while you're here to listen to me. So make sure you do. I haven't flown 3,000 miles of uh, people nodding off. Is that understood? And on the expense account, this is classified as a goodwill mission. Yeah, that'll do, that'll do. Now, now you all know what polystumor is. It's the sort of stuff that you can do things with. <laughs> Any questions? Well, now, as a gesture to... Our American hosts, British United Plastics, felt that we could demonstrate not only the properties of polystuma, but also the bonds that bind our two great nations by the motif which I shall now have great pleasure in unveiling, if only some trick would tell me where the blasted string is. It's in your left paw. Is it? Oh, oh, that, oh that's just a bit of string. Oh, I wonder what it was. Ladies and gentlemen, I now have great pleasure in declaring the British United Plastics stand open... And I trust you will appreciate this gesture to your great country. Ah! Ah! It's a mirage. It's got to be a mirage. Wait till I get my hands on stinking hinking. What on earth's gone wrong? Oh, can't you see the statue? Look at it. Look what she's holding in her hand where the torch should be. Hey, eh? Look at it. A blasted teapot. <laughs> Oh!
emblem. Something gigantic and cheap that we can stick up on top of the stand to symbolize the unity of our two great countries. Hands across the sea and all that boulder dash. And something that will drag the customers in so we can cop all those lovely dollars. Yes, yes, that does come into it. And course, how perspicacious of you to think of that. Yes. You see, there'll be so many firms from so many countries exhibiting their product that I feel we need something to make our stand the most attractive. How about a dozen dolly birds in British United Plastic Bikinis prancing about to rule Britannia? <laughs> that might be symbolic of you, but not of the firm. In any case, it's a very bad number to dance to, I find. No, what I had in mind was some form of statue or image made in our polystuma. What a good idea. Who's the statue to be of? Mr. Wilson. Oh. He's called one of these meetings of the board this morning, so they're all waiting to hear what it is this time and have their letters of resignation and checkbooks at the ready. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Settle down now. Tags out. Come along. Sir Charles is about to chat you up, so let's have a bit of decorum. That's a bit more like it. I hate to have to raise my voice. Now I have heard everything. That'll do. No muttering in the ranks. Now then, gentlemen, I have called you together this morning to discuss an urgent matter. How much? Oh, how unkind, Mr. Bizet, how unkind. When was the last time I asked the board for that sordid stuff that the hoi polloi call money? Tuesday. Fifty quid for polo pony fodder. Oh, what an accurate memory you have, Mr. Benson. A mind like a ledger. <laughs> Very commendable. <laughs> An asset to the company to put England needs in these times. Now shut your directorial cake hole, will you? Gentlemen! <clears throat> oh, Lord, here we go. I'll try again. Edith and gentlemen. Thank you. May I continue? Please do. How kind. Daft old bat. I <laughs> yell! <laughs> Gentlemen, I've asked you all here this morning to discuss the display stand that we're taking at the New York Home Hobbies Exhibition. Now, we need a motif. We need a what? Motif. Oh. And it's a French word, meaning motif. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an F on it. <laughs> Only one, though. It's motif. It means an F. gentlemen, we present The Big Business Lark by Laurie Wyman and starring Jimmy Edwards, Frank Thornton and Gwen Cheryl. <laughs> There's one thing that strikes terror into the hearts of the directors of British United Plastics. It's the memo from their managing director and chairman, Sir Charles Boniface, summoning them to an extraordinary meeting. It usually means one of two things. Either he's dropped the clangor of a lifetime or it's going to cost them a buck. Oh, don't be a nana all your life, Edith. We want the blasted thing to encourage people to visit our stand. <laughs> no, unless anybody has a better idea, I thought the statue should be about 40 foot high and as I'm head of the firm, it should be a statue of me. <laughs> I thought you said it was supposed to encourage people to visit the stand. <laughs> Right. Who wants a 40-foot high him? Well, uh, an awful lot of birds might be grateful for it. <laughs> I mean, uh, the ones on Nelson's column could visit him for their holidays. And yes, well, all right. Uh, then, all right, we can scrub that idea. Yes, I, that is a hazard that I must confess I hadn't considered. Sir Charles, uh, would it not be advisable to make this emblem a tribute to our American host? 